While I have gently edited it for my own voice, the bulk of this sermon was written and originally preached by my grandfather as the last sermon of the year in 1968. He titled it, What's the Use of Trying When Things in the World Are So Discouraging? Those of you who were around then may recall, 1968 was a pretty tumultuous year. Friends likely wished one another a happier New Year for 1969 and did their best to leave 1968 behind them. I chose this sermon because I think it speaks to some of the sentiments that we hold today, as well as to those of Moses and the Israelites, the lectionary text originally planned for this morning. In the text, long gone are the days when Joseph was held in high esteem and Egyptian and Israelite lived side by side. In their fear, the Egyptians have oppressed the Israelites and made them second-class citizens, with little hope of any change on the horizon. And then God speaks to Moses. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our sermon this morning asks a question, and actually the question is rather pessimistic. But then there wasn't too much about 1968 to make one optimistic about the future. Consider just these few facts as a stark outline. A Nobel Prize winner whose sole claim to fame was his leadership in the field of brotherhood and nonviolent action is cruelly shot down. An idealistic and hard-hitting young senator is assassinated two months later. Cities are torn with violence and civil strife. Rioting took place on college campuses. Many look to our political institutions for some signs of hope, but somehow felt cheated and degraded by the electoral process. A great country with almost unbelievable potential seemed to be falling apart at the seams. A foreign war and the struggle of black people for equality and opportunity tore, continue to tear at its soul and there seems to be no answer in sight yet. A college student in 1968 wrote home to his father, and in substance, what he said was this. Dad, why should I dig into history and literature, the physical sciences and sociology, when it looks as if I would be pulled into the army and probably spend the next important years of my life in a war? The fellows here are discouraged. Some are saying, Why try to do our best when the world is going to hell? The father said it was the most difficult letter he had ever received, and he was very troubled over how to answer it. It's not hard to wonder if this is the reason for the mood and unrest and agitation in our young people even today. They are uncertain and discouraged over a system which seems to neither reflect nor value who they are nor who they want to become. And so, in one form or another, then, as now, they protest. This, of course, is not simply the problem of youth. Everyone faces it. Sometimes the world and its values seem to be falling apart for all of us. It happens not only when we confront a troubled world, as in our time, but when personal problems seem to be more than we can bear. It may be tragedy that robs life of meaning. It may be plans that have been wrecked and you can't see how things can work out. It may be family problems. It may be that someone is drinking too much or hating too much or loving too little. You can name your own problem. It may not be large and significant like those problems that trouble our times, but enough to shatter your world. What's the use of trying when things are so discouraging? Now, I realize that it's easier to raise this question than it is to answer it. I also realize that the minister can try and be too smart and have something for everyone and for every problem and thereby end up answering none. And so my answer to this deep and rather poignant question will be cast in the form of general principles. I will wholesale it, hoping that you can retail it enough to apply to your life. A good place to begin is here. In discouraging times, we need more than ever to retain a sense of perspective. 
it is well to recognize that this is not the first time in history that people have looked at their world in a despairing mood. In 1806, William Pitt said, there is scarcely anything around us but ruin and despair. In 1829, John Randolph of Virginia threw in the sponge and said, the country is ruined beyond redemption. In 1849, Disraeli, commenting on the contemporary scene in England, said there is no hope. In 1852, the dying Duke of Wellington said, I thank God I shall be spared from seeing the consummation of ruin that is gathering around us. Or look at it this way. We commonly think of the 16th century as one of the great ages of history with the Protestant Reformation, the oncoming Renaissance, and all of that. But Erasmus, who lived through it, called it the excrement of the ages. Again, history refers to the 18th century as the Age of Enlightenment. It was a time of stirring political liberation with the American and French revolutions, with immense influence on the future history of the world. Yet Rousseau, the great writer who lived through it, described it as this great rottenness amidst which we live. You remember the story of Elijah and his contest with the prophets of Baal and how he had to flee for his life because the wicked Queen Jezebel threatened him for mistreating her prophets. In the wilderness, Elijah complains bitterly to God and wishes he could die. He tells the Lord how the children of Israel have forsaken his covenants, thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets, and I, even I, only I, am left. And the Lord sends him back, saying that there are still 7,000 faithful who have not bowed to Baal. It's so easy to fix our attention on the dark side, the gloom, and the despair. Although the prophets of despair and cynicism have never been proved right. To be sure, history is riddled with evil. The four horsemen of the apocalypse stalk their victims in every age. There is war, famine, and pestilence. There's poverty, injustice, corruption. But life goes on. Our most cherished values do survive. There is more to history than the record of humankind's fumbling foolishness and sin. In the turmoil and confusion of today, we need desperately this longer view of history. We need this perspective, too, in the midst of our own personal problems. It helps to know that others have walked this way, that others have shared the same experience and have come through. Though not necessarily an answer, it gives us hope. And in discouraging times, the first thing we need is hope. That's why it's important when people are going through difficult times not to shut themselves off, but to share their life and experience with others. We need some perspective. We need that long view. The second thing is this. When the world is at its worst, we need then particularly to be at our best. After World War II, two men in England were talking together. One of them was theologian, Basil Matthews. The other was an expert in the field of international politics, Sir Alfred Zimmern. Basil Matthews asked the political expert this question. What, in your opinion, is the chief obstacle to an enduring world peace? Sir Alfred's unhesitating answer was the small-scale individual. So that's the ultimate trouble. Technical problems of the gravest sort, major difficulties in planning and impl implementation, sure. But the ultimate trouble? Small-scale people. Surely, one of the most devastating things to be said of our times is that multitudes, finding themselves in this mess of a world, respond to it by being a mess themselves. So there are those in our midst who seem to be saying, there is a growing disrespect for the law. Why should I respect its structures? 
I will pull it down. Others are unjust. Why should I be just? Others are intolerant. Why should I be loving? To hell with the whole thing. I will become part of the problem myself. I see this as the devil's way of compounding the evil of our time by persuading us to become part of the evil. But there is another way. There are others who might easily be small-scale individuals, but who instead make a different response. They see the necessity of the best because the worst is so bad. They see the necessity of lighting a candle because the darkness is so grim and because it is always better to light a candle rather than to curse the darkness. It is they who make life possible and tolerable in a discouraging time. Bonaro Overstreet put it like this. You say, the little efforts that I make will do no good. They will never prevail and to tip the hovering scale where justice hangs in the balance. I don't think I ever thought they would, but I am prejudiced beyond debate in favor of my right to choose the side which I feel shall feel the stubborn ounces of my weight. In this regard, there is no question at all as to where the Christian stands. They need only to look at Jesus Christ. Christ never based his goodness, his love, his forgiveness, his life on what other people were doing. My meat and drink, he said, is to do the will of God in heaven. Christ never calls us to live by the easiest we know. He never calls us to live by the least common denominator. Christ calls us to live by the best that we know. This may not always be prudent. It may not be wise as the world sees it. But it is always right. Christ calls us to stand at our best in an evil time. Where the world is at its worst, we need more than ever to be at our best. A third thing we need to remember when we live in discouraging times is that God is Lord of all. And this means that God is the Lord of history. Now, I don't mean by that some shallow and easy doctrine that says that God makes everything happen just as it does, and that therefore there is goodness in everything. But I don't believe God makes wars to happen. Humans do. God doesn't make poverty. Humans do. God doesn't cause riots and violence. Humans do. Humankind, unfortunately, is free to make a mess of the world and of history. The doctrine of the providence of God, however, asserts that God overrules and uses the folly of humans to accomplish her own purposes, so that even the contradictions, the inconsistencies of history, the mystery of evil, is used by God. The providence of God asserts that life has meaning even when we cannot understand its pattern so that our best efforts and highest devotion are never wasted, even when we can't see how it's coming out. The artist Goya used to sit in a cafe in Paris and ask his friends to drop some crumbs of bread at random onto the tablecloth. No matter how crazy a pattern those crumbs fell into, he would work it into a beautiful picture. The providence of God is like that. No matter what crazy pattern the little crumbs of our life fall in, God uses it to produce a grand design. In their desire to escape Egyptian oppression, the Israelites were discouraged. In their desire for truth and peace, the philosophers were discouraged. In December of 1968, my grandfather called it living on the wrong side of Christmas, living as though the birth and life of Jesus 
had never happened. Living in the most abject ignorance of God's victory in Christ over all the powers of sin and death. And so we build all kinds of camouflages to cover our own spiritual poverty. We need to hear and know the good news. God has visited and redeemed his people. God is Emmanuel. God is with us. In discouraging times, you can live like a child of God. And you should.